Greetings from the dark continent, Conscious Caracal here or Adams Van Sale. And tonight we're shining a light again on the goings on down south. Tonight we're going to be talking about a very interesting and very important topic and theme, and that is building your own institutions, or as some people mm -hmm. have called it, uh, parallelism. And in South Africa, we're seeing the pioneers of exactly that type of philosophy already uh, picking the fruits of their resolve. So tonight, I'm talking to Dr. Dirk Herman. He is the CEO of Solidariteit, and he's going to be giving us a little bit of an insight into Soltech, the latest success in creating your own institutions and making sure that you and your children have a future in your own country. So welcome to the show, Herman. Oh, there. Thank you very much. Thanks. Um, and now I think something that we can get out of the way, first of all, is what the solidarity movement is and what solidarity is. Because I know when you were having your conversation last night uh, with Roman, uh, some people were confused with the name of solidarity and the, the government solidarity fund. And they were <laughs> asking, oh, that the same thing is there a connection? So mm -hmm. maybe, first of all, in terms of the solidarity movement and then solidarity as the union, what exactly are those two entities? Well, let's start with the Solidarity Fund and Solidarity. Uh, the government launched and fund Solidarity Fund, and that was a fund to mobilize capital for the uh, COVID-19 battle. Um, that is not solidarity. That is a, a name that they chose to say South Africa must be in solidarity against um, the, um, the virus and for the fight against the virus. And, but that's not us. Um, that's a state-driven um, fund, and that has nothing to do with us. And I don't want to go into the detail why I don't want to be associated with that specific fund, but uh, that's not us. But let's start then by just defining a bit uh, what solidarity is and what um, the solidarity movement is and what's the different institutions of the solidarity movement. Now, the solidarity movement has a very long history. We were formed in 1902. Now, 1902, of course, is a very important date. It is the end of the anglo Boer War, and that resulted in um, people that had to move from farms to uh, mines um, because of the Scorch Earth, Earth policy, and they had to start afresh um, on mines. As, of course, suddenly a total new kind of life. But an um, important thing had um, to be decided on. And that is um, where do we see our future as a community? The first thing was, uh, the first choice was to choose for the empire, the British empire. And that was the easier route because the fact is then you could actually via the empire stood up and be empowered because the country was in ruins after the anglo Boer war and there was a post-war depression and a drought. So there was real poverty at that stage. But the Afrikaner made a decision um, not for the empire, but for the community to take self-responsibility. That, that was a radical decision to say that, well, we will take self-responsibility with no resources because they were really, really poor. And uh, solidarity was born from that DNA. Um, at that stage, our name was the um, Transvaal Miners Association. And there were several self-help institutions that was formed after the war to answer that specific crisis. Then there was a second crisis. And the second crisis was after the First World War. And then there was, of course, the rebellion of 1914, 1915. And after that, again, real poverty, a real crisis, and then it resulted in the Help Makar movement. And again, that was a choice for the community and self-help and not via the government. And there was a third crisis. The third crisis was the crisis of the 1930s, um, the so-called poor white problem. Um, around about a third of Afrikaners were jobless at that stage, and two thirds were poor. And that resulted in a real um, crisis, a social crisis, an economic crisis for them. And then that led to a new form of self-help. And that new form of self-help was um, then um, um, formed um, in the form um, of uh, the, not the Helpacar uh, movement, but that, uh, that was called um, 
um, uh, um, oh yeah, now I forgot um, uh, the exact <laughs> name, um, but that resulted in another um, um, helper car um, action. And that was actually inspiring to see how the community take self-responsibility in three different crises. And that then resulted in our thinking um, in, let's call it the new solidarity. Um, we were um, formed in 2001 as solidarity. Before that, we were still the Mine Workers Union. Flip Base was appointed as the General Secretary in 1997. And then we've decided to become a movement much bigger than the trade union. And we started with the trade union to make it strong. And then we started to launch other institutions. And that other institutions form a movement of so, um, civil organizations. And that movement of civil organizations was then called the Solidarity Movement. And that is the movement. So Solidarity is the trade union. They initiated the movement. But what's important now is that the different institutions of the movement is self-reliant institutions within a federal structure that takes responsibility for themselves within our philosophy of self-help. So that is institutions like, for instance, the Solidarity Helping Hand that takes responsibility on the social side. They, uh, uh, that was also the first institution that we've launched. And thereafter, we've launched Afri Forum, we've launched um, Academia, the university, we've launched um, Soltec, the technical college, and uh, we've launched uh, Marula Media, the media company, and then the Federation of Afrikaans Cultural, Cultural Organizations, the FRK, also joined the Solidarity Movement. And we started a financial services company and an investment company and, uh, um, and a school support um, company. So that is all different institutions of the civil society that was then formed as a movement. And it is called the Solidarity Movement because it was initiated from solidarity. But now solidarity, the trade union, is of course one of the vibrant institutions of the whole movement. Mm. Uh, now, Dr. Arman, uh, you, when you look at, for example, the history of trade unions, uh, there seems to be a very big left-wing theme uh, to trade unions. What is the philosophy or the tradition of uh, solidarity that makes it uh, stand out within that history? Now, this Interesting enough, there's actually two traditions of trade unions. The one tradition of trade unions is the Christian tradition of trade unions. It's an old tradition. It was actually followed the Christian guilt um, uh, movement, um, but it was also a reaction on the socialist movement of trade unionism that was formed after the Industrial Revolution. The Industrial Revolution, there was mass employment, mass exploitation, and then the socialist tradition said there must be a mass answer. The socialist tradition says the answer lies in centralization, and then um, goods and uh, power must be centralized and then redistributed. And the moment it is redistributed, we will see equality. So equality is actually their central theme. But in the Christian tradition of trade unionism, you see a tradition of movement. So around the Christian um, tradition, uh, trade unions, movements are formed. Mov movements that take a bigger responsibility in the community because that resulted from the idea of calling, where you take responsibility for your calling and your future. And the um, Christian tradition of trade unions is much more free market or, um, uh, orientated. And then, of course, the Christian tradition of trade unions also mobilized against in the Eastern Europe, like, for instance, in Poland, the uh, solidarity of Lech Walesa, mo uh, mobilized against the communist state. And that resulted then in the fall of communism in East, Eastern Europe. So interesting enough, the trade union movement, resulted in the fall of communism and that was more a free market orientated christian trade union movement and we of course come from that specific tradition of trade unions and of course the christian idea and basis is a um, basis that is uh, well known in the afrikaner community and therefore afrikaners felt at ease with the um, um, christian tradition of trade unionism and of course it was a very easy platform 
to launch a movement from. And that also was aligned with the historic DNA of Afrikaners that actually um, believe in self-help and, the, um, and to, to take self-responsibility via the community. Mm. I think that's something very important that needs to be emphasized, those two traditions. Uh, but now that we've laid the foundation, uh, you, uh, as a solidarity, laid a foundation that's very significant, and that is the foundation of Saltic. Um, can you give us an idea of what is Saltic? What exactly is its purpose and what is its mission and what is its philosophy? Okay, just a bit of background on that. We decided to um, focus on training and development. Um, the question was, how do we address the challenges of the future? And again, we believe in self-help, and that means responsibility and self-responsibility. And how do we help young people to take self-responsibility? Well, we do that by enabling them with knowledge. We don't make them, them dependent on a system. We say that it's your responsibility, but we will help you with an institution with study aid, if it's necessary, that you must pay back to another student, and then also with knowledge. And the institution, the study aid, and of course, high quality education, that empower young people to take self-responsibility for the future. So that is aligned with our broader idea of self-responsibility. So that is why we have in the solidarity movement, a strong, strong training component that starts with a school component where we have a school support system. We have developed a whole curriculum. Um, um, we call it the Vault School um, that helps students online to study and support them. And it, of course, um, um, developed much faster um, in this specific time when we started with lockdown we had around about three to four thousand kids on our um, um, on Vox school and after the lockdown 127 thousand so it grew tremendously so we start on school level then we move to technical level that is Saltic. then we move to university level that is academia and then we have a continuous learning company as well so that you can have a lifelong learning experience so we take you on the whole path of learning and um, we help you thus to get access to the workplace and then to learn all the way through so that is the background so one of the uh, institutions of learning is Saltic and Saltic that takes responsibility specific, uh, specifically on the vocational um, level and we focus at this stage specifically on tri trades and uh, quite successful um, it's not in this young the campus um, we only um, um, finished last year and the first students of course started this last week um, but the institution itself is around about um, 12 years old so we started very very um, small we started in the office, in the Solidarity Office Park, and then we moved to a bigger campus, and then a third campus, much bigger, and then only we built this world, absolutely world-class campus. And the reason why we did that is because we could not um, 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 uh, just develop um, through for instance, uh, state money or for big business so that he has a big investor, and big capital. We had to build Saltec via small money of the community. So we went to our members and asked them to donate 10 rand a month and they did. And that we started and we could buy what is necessary to build Saltec and we made it bigger and bigger and every month 10 rand, 10 rand, 10 rand. And then it created a lot of enthusiasm. And people from the bigger community then come and say, well, we want to donate as well. So then we got a hundred rand a month or a hundred and fifty rand a month. And this small amounts resulted in a college that now um, cost 300 million rand. So it was just an amazing story of a community that took self-responsibility. 
there's around about 1,5 million bricks in that specific building. But the power of the building is that there's a name on every brick. That means that someone donated the 10 rand and that's mine. So it's a real living monument of hope. And that is the power of this statue. And I think that is why there's so much enthusiasm about the specific campus, because this campus show that the community can take self-responsibility within a situation of a weakening state. Mm. Um, so yes, uh, so Dr. Herman, you explained the, the how and the what of Soltech. Now, I think something, uh, a question that specifically someone on the outside looking in, especially a foreign listener, would ask is why Soltech? So they would ask the question of why would you take this a massive amount of funds just so you, that you can have an Afrikaans technical university? Maybe enlighten, for example, people that don't quite grasp the South African context or environment, uh, give them some information on why this is such a, a significant but important thing to do. It's on different levels. Let's start with level one. Level one is simply because the state is weakening and the state institution's quality is of such a nature that um, you go on risk if you get trained at a state college. So the quality of technical um, um, education in South Africa is poor. That's the one point. The second point is that if you look at the power of mother tongue education, especially, specifically in technical environments where there's a lot of abstract con um, 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 concepts, um, mother tongue education is a powerful tool. But in South Africa, we've moved and Afrikaans is um, phased out at all the state institutions. And what we say is, well, then we want to take self-responsibility. You sit thus with a weakening state, with a political agenda. The, um, on the one side, the phasing out of Afrikaans. And on the other side, they came with strict racial quotas, racial quotas for um, study aid, racial uh, quotas for access, with an ideology of absolute representativity in the state environment. So they created this an unfriendly environment for Afrikaners in the education sphere, specifically, specifically in the technical environment. And then this community that is phased out now, so what? We are not going to be phased out. We will take self-responsibility. So that is on the one side a reaction thus on the state and the weakening of um, the South African state and the fact that uh, the environment is planted. So that is the, on the one side. But on the other side, it is all about a community that say that we take self-responsibility. And the moment that you take self-responsibility, you take control of your future, then you can be in a, weakening, a state that's weakening, but the future is specifically in your hands. And that's freedom. That is freedom. The power to make your decision about your future. You are not dependent on the state anymore. And that is, of course, SOLTIC is one element. It's a symbol of that. But what AFRI Forum is, for instance, doing on the um, um, security, the safety and security um, field, it's exactly the same. What the helping hand is doing on the social field, it's the same. What Solidarity is doing now with the, its um, um, a network of, of guilds in, in the work in the environment, it's exactly the same. Uh, we do the, that on university level, level, on continuous learning level. So all on all these levels, we say, we take self-responsibility. And the moment that you do that, you experience freedom. And that is the real reason, the power to make your own decisions. And then you can say, well, I'm not dependent on the central state anymore. And that brings me by, by the question, uh, to the question, if the state was e effective, would you then do the same? And the answer is yes, you will do exactly the same because you don't want um, to be slaves of a state, um, not an effective state, and definitely not an ineffective state. Mm. 
Um, I'm just going to get to some uh, some comments here so far. So uh, Russell McLaren says, well done, Solidarity. When Mukweng said you must build your own Afrikaans institutions with private funds, I'm sure he was confident that you wouldn't actually do it. Uh, he thought he had won. So I think uh, the central point there is that Saltic is a big monument to that phosphate mentality and showing that it can be done. And uh, Xavier Babu says, uh, first, congratulations, does not actually say it well enough. You have given hope to South Africans of all walks. Then also uh, a comment here that I saw was uh, <laughs> people are lining up to ask on how they can how they can join and where they can uh, sign up. And I see uh, here's a question from Ihu Krier who asks, is it possible for international students that aren't in SA to enroll at academia? So maybe before you answer that question, uh, what is academia? Yeah, let's go back to academia. I just want to go to that comment on Mohaeng. That is, um, of course, a reference to the Stellenbosch case. Now, we, we, of course, were all disappointed in the fact that the Constitutional Court said that um, Afrikaans um, on, a, 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 on a public institution with taxpayer funds um, is actually a problem. And I think that's wrong. I don't think that is what the Constitution um, meant, but that is how the Constitutional Court interpreted that. But Mohen then said that um, he encouraged private institutions um, um, to be built, specifically Afrikaans institutions, and then he said that he encouraged corporate South Africa to help to build such institutions. And that, of course, is then, at least for private institutions, a confirmation from the Constitutional Court that, yes, you can. So that is maybe uh, that's where that specific remark will come from. Okay, let's come then to um, the question on academia. Academia is our university. We started um, um, with a very, very dynamic um, new technology approach to academia. And um, um, we started with a telematical um, technology that is real dy dynamic. And we have centers all over South Africa. And um, there is around about uh, 1,000, I think around about 1,000, 6,700 students enrolled at this stage at the different centers. And it's a huge success. But we want to go further, and therefore we, um, in, on the 15th of March, big news, we're going to um, launch the Academia Campus. It's a bit small, smaller campus in Centurion, and that is a campus that um, we now use. There, there can be around about um, a thousand um, students there on campus. So it's a bit new model um, that we add to our current a model of centers throughout South Africa. And then, of course, our next phase or third phase of academia is to build a full-fledged new campus. Um, we already bought the land, 220 hectares. Um, so, um, um, Saltic uh, costed that as around about 300 million rand. Um, and um, that includes, of course, the um, hostels that still must be built. But academia will be around about 1.8 million uh, 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 not 1.8, um, uh, yeah, 1.8 billion um, rand. Uh, that means six times Saltex. So we will, we're going to be built six Saltex for the u new university. It's going to be huge. Um, and um, so we are quite excited about that. So that is the next big, big um, project that we come, um, come with. I just want to say uh, something that is, that is, of course, a community that come and say, we built a technical college of 300 uh, million rand. We built a university of 1.8 billion rand. Um, we make provision for our youth. We are busy to um, launch a whole new school system. That is a community that say, we are here to stay. We're not going to go anywhere. We are here. We are investing in your young people because we're going to stay. We're going to build the future. So academia and Saltic is strong, strong political statements. And I think that is the frustration of a Panyasa and a Sufi that drive by and say, these guys that I want to chase, uh, chase out of every public sphere, they are here to stay. Look at this building. So I can understand this frustration. Um, and then, Mr. Lusufi, your frustration is going to be much, much bigger if we build academia and that comes. Okay, now your question on academia and then international students. The good news is, 
And that is what, what COVID-19 and lockdown brought to us. We had to change our system um, systems quite dramatically um, at academia, especially our online systems. And we could develop a model that can, um, of course, offer an individual service at your home. Originally, we said that we're only going to focus on centers. So you have to go to class, and that is still the better option. And we have, uh, we have 12 centers to go, um, um, around South Africa. But now we have an individual offering at your home, and thanks to um, the challenges of um, the lockdown on COVID-19. That means that we now, this year, already um, got numerous international students at academia. So, Ihe, yes, international students now can enroll at academia seamlessly. I think that answers this question perfectly, and you also added on some very interesting information there as well. Uh, Koketso Rezani says, uh, this story deserves its own documentary. So I hope uh, mm -hmm. they at Solidarity are planning one day to tell your story in full, maybe in the form of a documentary. It seems like mm -hmm. people would like to mm -hmm. see that. Yeah. It is a story to tell. And uh, we are quite excited about um, the story. Um, um, if you look at um, um, what, what happened from 1997 to now, 1997, the old mining workers union was literally bankrupt, um, bankrupt um, financially, but also on an idea level. And then we had to actually think everything over again. And um, it was a young bunch of guys that started in 1997. Flip was just um, in his thirties. And then um, I um, started also in 97. Kali Kill started then. Um, we, um, um, we were then just in you know, late 20s and um, and so on. So so then we started this thing and we rethink it and we said, how much we position ourselves within the new reality that will come? So we said, what's going to happen in a couple of years' time? And we tried to position ourselves for that. So we knew that ANC simply just um, doesn't have the ideology to govern a modern economy. And we see it now. So we had to say, how do we position ourselves for that? And that is quite exciting. Um, I um, Last night on the interview that you also seen, I also told the story of my, my father. He's 85 years old, the wise old man. And I visited him a week or so, or a bit longer ago. And uh, he said to me, I just want to make sure that um, solidarity applied the 50-year rule. I ask him, what's the 50-year rule? And that is to plan for, uh, for, for 50 years from now on. And he said then, and the reason for that is you must plan for the next generation. And that is the power of a civil movement. A civil movement plans for the next generation and not only for uh, a next election, for instance. So uh, I think one of the big questions that uh, a lot of people ask and maybe one of the worries that they have is when it comes to these types of institutions, even though it is very impressive that they can be built, is that how do we make sure that these new institutions are never taken away from our community or from the people that built them or that they are not destroyed uh, or uh, regulated by the government or pretty much uh, made uh, regulated in such a way that they struggle to function? Uh, what how? Did solidarity go about considering these types of risks in regards to protecting and preserving these new institutions that cost so much money, blood, sweat, and tears? We have two choices. The first choice is to do nothing because of the risk. And if you do nothing, you will have nothing. That's your one choice. So, well, because of the risk, sorry, I'm not going to do anything. That's the one choice. But the second choice is to build more. And, and that is the best risk avoider is to build as fast as possible, as big as possible, to put down a reality on the ground, to make sure that you create a de facto reality. And de facto realities at the end of the day resulted in the URA recognition. And that is what we do now. We just put the reality on the ground. And that is exactly what happened with Soltec. Let's take, when we first announced Soltec, that was um, 
October 2019, we had a whole function of, on that empty stand or empty land. And then there was this aggressive reaction against us. The Sufis said that we, I will close you down, I promise. And he was actually, I was um, worried about this guy, um, 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 health. And, um, and and then we started to build. And the more we built, the more we created the reality. And now it's finished. And the first students are there. The official launch is only the end of uh, March this year. But suddenly, the recognition of that monument that stands there is much more positive than about a year ago because it's a reality and you recognize realities and um, and if it will happen that the state of um, the government wants to regulate or want to close it down unless if he wants to do it then we then we fight it but the fact of the matter is you can't fight for the right of salting if there's no salt and I think that's the big lesson from this is that uh, if you you can become paralyzed by your own worries, uh, you're so worried that something will be taken away from you or will be damaged or destroyed that you don't even build it in the first place. So I think that is a very important lesson specifically for anyone, not only in South Africa, but also in other countries that want to embark on building their own institutions is that fact that as you build um, and as you mentioned, Doctor, the, the reality will start to conform to your your vision uh, and uh, that reality will become stronger and stronger and then it will also become harder and harder to break or destroy or steal or take away from you yes absolutely sir uh, i see a uh, carl green zeta says dirk is a very wise man uh, so he <laughs> uh, seems to be very impressed of your your answer there so, so, I, just, I just want to know if it's okay with you if i share that with my wife Mm. <laughs> I think that will be perfect. Um, so, Doctor, something else that a lot of people I saw on social media were asking questions about is who is allowed to enroll at Soltech? So who is this institution for? Who is going to be allowed? Uh, how is that going to work? Maybe you can shed some light on that. Yes. Let's just start by saying where does the energy for Soltech comes from? And that's important to understand that the building energy for Saltec comes from a cultural community. And that is cultural energy that can mobilize people in the thousands to give a 10 rand and a 100 rand and a 50 rand, etc., to build the institution like this. A culture that say, hey, well, we're going to stay right here and we want to take self-responsibility and we have the historic DNA to do that. That is not strange for us and that is why we do it. The reason why I say that is there was one uh, more than one call in um, the past week or five um, on us to say that why don't you build a Saltic rather for all in South Africa? The answer is because we take responsibility for our community and our cultural and energy lies there. What we hope is that we create enough energy around Saltic that other communities do exactly the same. Take self-responsibility for their specific community, for their language, etc. And that is, of course, true for the whole of the Solidarity Movement. We will be much than uh, much, uh, we will be uh, willing um, to help any community that want to do the same. We'll be excited about that. Right. Then what we say is that what we do is we build an institution for the Afrikaans community. The fact is we were kicked out from the public institutions and now we take self-responsibility um, for the Afrikaans community. Um, what we say is that we um, feel strong about the institution, um, and uh, but we say that anyone that can speak Afrikaans, of course, is welcome to come and study at this specific institution. And then what we say is, the moment that you um, do this, you get the cultural energy, 
you build the institution and then these kids these students are sent out into south africa to build the economy and to create jobs that's what they do they then come and build much bigger than the original energy that built this specific campus mm. Because uh, here in South Africa, we are quite aware that a lot of commentators that have had a, a lot of uh, not too friendly things to say about Solidarity or Afri Forum have now, in the as the news broke of Soltech, uh, said that uh, maybe South Africa needs uh, an Afri Forum, but for all, or a Solidarity for all, uh, one of these commentators right. being Max Dupria. So I'm, I'm taking that your answer there is pretty much your answer to those types of people saying that that energy, that cultural energy behind Solidarity, Afri Forum, Alpena, and the, the Solidarity movement, it's that energy that makes it possible, not just the idea. Absolutely. And that's a historic DNA um, that, um, uh, that we use. And that's why I started with the different crises um, of the Anglo War, the 1914, the 1930s. Every time that there was a specific crisis in the past hundred years, Afrikaners took that cultural energy and they mobilized that and they broke out of that specific crisis. So they do that. But of course, there's other kinds of energy as well. I live in Pretoria, in the Moot area, and here's a local energy that's not necessarily cultural. That is a local community that say that, well, we take responsibility for your safety. And that is more a local. And there's energy in that as well. The community of, of um, the Muad say that we take responsibility for the Muad. So that is more a local kind of energy. And that's good. I'm positive about that. And then, of course, there's certain issues that, of course, is, is more South African issues. Oh, and then maybe there's, uh, there's energy there as well. And, um, but in this specific case, uh, building a university, a technical college, and so on, that source is from a cultural source. And don't take that away. Don't take it away. If you say to me, to, to me, move away from your source, then I think we'll be built. A very quick question here, Doctor, from Paul Pretorius. I'll translate it quickly. He asks, when is the first, or when is there an open day for Saltec? Um, yes, um, well, there's an open day for students um, in March, and um, I don't have the exact date, so I'm more than willing to, to give it the, through the moment um, to, to, or maybe to you if you um, have your detail. Um, that's for students. And then what we want to do is to have Saltec an open um, college. What I mean through that is that anyone can at any time go and visit it. We have our students, they go through a program and the pro um, so that they can take visitors through Saltic. So that's a living monument. And want, we want people to go and visit the specific monument. So we want to have a feeling at Saltic, come and visit us, come and see what we do. And uh, we will take you through official tours and, uh, and show you this. But the student open day is, is um, 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 it's, I think in March, and um, um, you can visit Soltex website, and I'm quite sure all the information will be on there. Mm. Ah, yes, yes. The yes. Website is on the screen currently, and also if you are too lazy to type it in, the the link is in the description of the video, so you can just click on that, and it will take mm -hmm. you directly to the website. There's also a link to Solidarität's website if you want to go read up them they also have a translate option on their website so if you are for example listening from abroad you can translate it to english and you can uh, see everything going on there yeah. um so doctor you mentioned that uh, other communities that you would be very excited if other communities also built their own institutions started taking responses uh, responsibility for their own community have you had any of these types of inquiries or questions or interest uh, since the news of Saltec broke? Yes. There's a realization in South Africa that the state is not working. And you see, there was um, for a long time still hope on the state and, um, and, and the central government, because that, that is the, the, the natural answer. The state must provide 
and, um, um, and, and, and there's a realization that the state can't provide on a very, very broad front. Now, at the stage when we said the state will can't provide, we must build, and we started around about 15 years ago with all your different build projects. It, um, we were accused and said, well, you're, you're a bunch of racists. Um, you say that blacks can't govern. That's not true. But we said that the ideology of the ANC is not the uh, uh, um, ideology that can govern. It's a struggle ideology. And uh, we knew that. And we see the result at this stage of a struggle ideology that tried to govern. And um, uh, so there is a broad realization of the problem with the state. And now, what do we do now? Because that can be um, um, news that can make you very anxious or can free you and say, well, I take self responsibility. And uh, we had a workshop um, today and yesterday with a group of black Africans that um, we workshop on this idea of self-help. Um, AfriForum, and specifically Bharat Ace at AfriForum, do this amazing work at this stage in traditional communities where they take the principle of self-help in the communities and they create the projects that help with self-sustainability of those specific communities. So what we see is more and more a realization of the state is not working and the community that take, must take much more responsibility. The power of the community is much stronger than the might of the state. I think that's a lesson that a lot of people are increasingly learning specifically now uh, as people are relying more on their communities almost out of desperation. Uh, when times are getting tough and uh, my heart goes out to anyone that uh, are going through tough times but i think there is light at the end of the tunnel in regards to communities rediscovering uh, what it is about and what community really means for people and how that can help them through tough times but uh, my uh, sorry my just uh, like, uh, yeah share your thoughts please three remarks on on this the first one i said the power of the community it's absolutely amazing what the community can do. Um, I just want to say again the example of Saltic, where 10 rands of community built a college of 300 million rand. That's power. That's the one thing. The second thing that I just want to refer to is what we experience at this stage is the absolute power of the youth. And our young people adopted to the specific circumstances that we are in. And, um, and they know how to deal with that. And sometimes, as all the generation, look at the situation and say, well, there's no future. Um, look at the situation at this stage. And my frame of mind can't get a solution. But my daughters that grew up in this current situation they adapt it and they get answers for the specific problems. The third thing that I just want to refer to is the power of the fourth industrial revolution. And we can debate a bit about the name fourth industrial revolution. Also. But the fact of the matter is, he has new technology that brings us answers for questions that we thought there's no answers for. Answers on training and development techniques, on new school um, diagnostic techniques, on energy, on safety. Things that we originally thought lies 100% within the sphere of the national state. We can do that now through communities because of new breaking technology. And these three things, the power of the community, young people, and then the third one is new technology makes it possible for us to get answers even within an environment of a weakening and a blended state. I think those are very important lessons that we are lear uh, learning currently in South Africa. And as I keep telling my listeners from abroad, uh, I think they will be learning in America some of these lessons later on. So if they have a close eye on South Africa, they might be ahead of the curve in regards to solving these types of problems, as even their government just seems to be growing and growing 
uh, and uh, doesn't seem to be uh, really doing exactly what they wanted to last, do. Last so, year, we we visited France, and they had this absolute problem with a demographic revolution, and they feel alienated within their own country. And we had a whole long discussion on how you can take self responsibility as a community. And that was quite a realization for French people within their own country. And I just want to say that maybe the Americans will have the same problem and, 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 and um, we do the work for you and you can come and we will share. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's exciting to be the pioneers uh, in regards to this type of uh, this time in history. I see there's a question for me. Uh, variable Vision asks Adams van Sale, how is AfriForum state proofing their initiatives? Well, uh, Variable, uh, we don't have to state proof our, in our, our initiatives, seeing as our in initiatives are state proofed by design. So this can go about through using firstly community funds, not relying on one or two or a handful of people funding us or even getting state support. All of AfriForum's initiatives are funded by our members, so that's already a decentralization of power. Secondly, it's a, a shared vision that we're building our initiatives on. So it's not uh, that our initiatives are being done for a profit motive. They're being done for something deeper, something culturally rooted, uh, which also gives them a lot of robustness and state proofing. And then lastly, in regards to how you state proof your initiatives or how your initiatives are state proof, is that you pretty much take ownership and responsibility. So if they fail, that is on you, but if they succeed, you can also celebrate with it. So you don't blame anyone if they fail. Uh, if your institute, if your uh, initiatives aren't working exactly as you planned, you learn from your mistakes and you go forward rather than saying, uh, having someone to blame or having a scapegoat. So I would say rather than having to think about how we state proof our, in our initiatives at AFRI Forum, our initiatives are state proof by design. Um, and then, uh, Dr. Arman, uh, there is something that I think uh, also needs to be discussed, and that is where did this inspiration come from that Saltic is possible? Uh, I'm looking just at the reactions from people, looking at the, the story and the words they are using. They are saying magnificent, uh, impressive, uh, unbelievable. It seems like people can't even believe what they see being accomplished in front of them. How did you at Solidarity believe that you could even accomplish this, this monumental feat? It's all about the vision. And the guy that carried the vision of the bigger Solidarity movement is, of course, Flo Bais. So he started in 1997 as the general secretary. And what he inherited, it was a real... Um, well, a bankrupt organization that, of course, played a tremendous role in South Africa, but uh, was bankrupt for its um, in, in its time. And Flip came and he just has this absolute vision and he just believed in it. And he said that, well, this is the way to go. We must build a movement. We must build institutions and um, we must build a technical college. He, from the beginning, he said technical college, um, but also an university. And that was in 1997. And in 1997, we still had this euphoria um, around Mandela and the new South Africa and so on. And Flip said over and over again, people, what we must look at as the, at the ideology of the ANC, can they govern? They know they can't. We must start with something new, something fresh. And we started to build at that stage, maybe, um, at, um, the community at that stage thought it's too early, and 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 flip, but flips only drove the specific vision. So the inspiration is of course from from flip base insight. Now where where did flip got that? Well, in the first place from the historical DNA of the um, of the Afrikaners. He's a well well read person, um, especially on history and also Afrikaner history. And flip also visited Israel. And it was just amazing what the trade union movement in Israel did. Um, it was um, called, it's still called the Easter Drut. The, 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 the meaning of Easter Drut is, is movement. And they just came and through worker money, they started to build a de facto reality. And um, the de jure recognition of that, that de facto reality came much, much later. Um, so that was the Afrikaner story. 
the story of the Easter truth in Israel inspired us. And then the third thing is the Christian trade union movement, especially in Europe, um, that built movements. Then the third, uh, the next one is was the um, trade union movement in Germany that built technical colleges. And then, of course, the solidarity um, trade union in Poland of Lech Walesa that brought um, the whole idea of Christian trade unionism um, versus um, the centralized socialist trade unionism to the fore. So it was actually a bunch of things that formed our thinking on this. Uh, and seeing as you learned lessons from all around the world, it seems, and also other movements in other countries, the whole process of building Soltech must have been a, a lesson in itself. Uh, could you maybe share some of the lessons that you learned along the way as Soltech was being built one brick at a time? What, what are some of the things that stood out to you that definitely that you would like to share with other people that try these types of uh, projects or initiatives? Yes. It was a long process and uh, we um, did not build by creation. They say, well, here is it. Um, we started at the very, very beginning and quite small. And we made mistakes. And we tried different models. And uh, 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 some of the models did not work. And we worked through that and we started again. And we changed our model. So it was a long process. And we first started to, um, to build it on a small scale and then move it to a, a, a bigger campus that we framed. And then a third campus even bigger and then only we start, decided to buy land and we said that let's first make the institution strong enough to actually rent a campus like this because our model at this stage is we've established a property development company canton and this property company built Saltec. so we have a specialized company that built and and Saltec that actually specialize on the learning side. And we built and Saltec at this stage rent from the property company. So that worked quite good. But we went through a court battle of 80 years to get the rights on that specific land. Um, it is next to the Waterkloof uh, Water Air Force Base. And the Air Force started with a legal battle against us. That is the state. Over and over again, they appealed everything and appeal again and again without any merits. And at the end of the day, we've won the court case simply because they did not have merits, but they frustrated the process. Eight years, but we just continued. We've won that court case. And then we started to build from October 2019 to December 2020, but longer than a year. We've built it under budget and in a period of lockdown and we've succeeded within our time frame. It was just an amazing story, but it's also a story of endurance. I think, uh, like I said, in terms of South Africa being the head of the curve, I think uh, a lot of people internationally are watching and uh, looking at what's happening in South Africa. I see here, uh, sideline opinion says uh, planning, planning, and more planning, budget, 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 measure twice, cut once. Uh, I think that is the story of, uh, of Saltec uh, summed up there. Um, now, maybe one of the final things that uh, I wanted to discuss was uh, your future plans. Now, um, the the dreams of solidarity and the solidarity movement and Afri Forum seem to uh, astonish people when we tell them what we're planning. They, uh, a lot of people say it can never be done. Um, but firstly, before we go to that, maybe as a, an example of the successes that you are, are gaining in regards to academia, as I heard, uh, I read in the news today that academia received an award, uh, the university itself. That's absolutely so. Um, we uh, uh, we have a BCom, um, a strong BCom faculty, and um, and that um, BCom faculty was then recognised um, with an award of excellence um, today, and um, um, from the um, uh, the, the uh, professional body, and um, that was just amazing to see that um, um, the academia is recognised as one of the best in South Africa. And that is what you can do, world-class 
in Afrikaans. That's simply possible. Mm. Uh, so now to get to the question of uh, what are the future plans, uh, are there anything that you can reveal in regards to what is still within the imagination or vision rather of solidarity, but that will definitely be a reality in the future? Yes, <clears throat> a couple of things. Of course, we um, within the bigger solidarity movement, we have a lot of institutions, including Afri Forum, Marula Media, etc. What I will focus now on is on the institutions that is near to solidarity self. Um, and that is all the training institutions and the work-related institutions. Now, we are quite excited about where we go now. The next um, big project, of course, is the launch of the Academia on Campus um, offering, and that is in March of this year, a new campus in Centurion, quite excited about that. Then the next one on that is then the build of uh, the new um, the new academia campus, that's at 1.8 billion rand campus outside Pretoria. We've already bought the land, 220 hectares, now in a process of rights. So we are quite excited about that. That will be a full-fledged university with, um, with all the different fac uh, faculties. We are now in a process to submit um, around about um, 35 new degrees to be accredited, to get ready for the big, big campus. We are quite excited about that. Um, then the next one is, of course, um, schools. So what we plan now to do, we want to take the school support system and the work school to absolutely new level. And then we, um, we are now in a process of planning to build a new model school that will be absolutely world-class school aligned with academia, where um, academia will help with, uh, um, with best educational practices uh, with research on that. So it will be a university um, that support, that's, it, it's a bit of the Japan model that support the school. And that will be an absolute model school that's a primary and a secondary school. And then from that, we will then roll out um, um, plans, actually a franchise to enable communities to build their own schools. So we foresee that there will be in the future that's a network of world-class private schools um, that um, will need the budget of order in the South African, uh, South African will not be elite schools. Um, uh, um, people like Tien Elof and his organization MOS is also doing great work on this. So I think there's a lot of things working at this stage on the school level. Then if you come to solidarity, we have a very excited project at this stage, and that is to launch a network of occupational guilds where we were a traditional trade union for quite long, we've decided, no, we don't want to be a traditional trade union. In the um, today's reality, trade unions um, is actually playing a very negative role in our economy. So we said that we want to go back to the old model of guilds where occupations take self-responsibility for their occupation, for continuous learning, to bring young people into the specific uh, occupation. And within three to five years from now, you will see a whole network of guilds taking responsibility for themselves and trade among each other and within the guild itself. And that will also be in very close cooperation. You are with Afri Forum, Afri Forum's um, um, business network that they've launched. So it's a nice interactive kind of system of helping each other, supporting each other. So. I think that is a few ideas on where we go. I'm uh, definitely excited in regards to the, the path forward. And I know a lot of people are watching very curiously uh, in terms to see if, uh, if we succeed or fail. Um, Dr. Amman, thank you a lot for your time. The last question is, how do people support these types of initiatives? If they like what you're saying here, they find inspiration from what uh, you're telling them, how can they support these types of projects, initiatives, and this movement? Remember, the um, that is, this is a community project. So we can only be successful if, if the community support us. Um, Saltec, like I said, is built by thousands of people that gave small amounts of money. And we want to ask people to help us to build the institution and by small amounts, a 10 rent or a 100 rent or so. With the Academia campus, and we will make more information about that now um, available, we're going to have a, a much different approach. 
we're going to set um, uh, take Canton, the property development company, and we're going to change that so that you can invest in the property side of the company with an um, um, with with a view of um, a good um, return on your investor, the financial return on your investment. So that we will make uh, more information available. But what we ask now is to support the different institutions. You can choose which one. There's different institutions that you can um, choose from. You can go to Solidarity's website. On Solidarity website, you can see how you can uh, donate to um, this different initiatives by a small amount. And you can go to Every Forum's website, the Helping Hands um, website. But we need your support. We can't continue without the community. This is a community project. It's not a solidarity project or a Every Forum or a Helping Hand or a um, academia project. It's a community project. So please, if you can support us and um, through small donations, please do that. Be part of this huge project. And I think that that will enable uh, the solidarity movement to achieve even more things, uh, even greater than Saltic. I think we're only getting started. Uh, Dr. Aman, thank you so much for all of your time. Thank you for your insights. Uh, uh, you've g given me a lot to think about, but I think a lot of the people that listened also uh, were very impressed with what they heard, and it's given them hope. Uh, one of the listeners specifically said that uh, what they're hearing here tonight is giving them some hope finally from a, a lot of the, the more depressing stuff they're seeing around them. So I think this is very important. Uh, discussion it's also very good for people to to get this type of hope that uh, there are people behind the scenes working for a future in south africa as you say at solidarity uh you the bow to play your building to stay and i think that is the rallying cry that uh, is uh, building places like saltic so Dr. Aman, enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you very much uh, for your time. And also, thank you very much for everyone that uh, tuned in uh, and listened for all their questions and your comments. Uh, very much appreciated. Um, and then also, you can check me again on this channel next week. If you're new here and you like these types of conversations, you can subscribe. You can also leave a like. Uh, it helps out the show. If you're listening and it's not live, uh, you're listening afterwards, you can leave a comment as well with your thoughts or questions. Uh, get part of the conversation and then also lastly links to solidarity's website and saltex website and also the uh, dr arman on twitter on twitter are all in the description of the video so you can go check it out for yourself good night everyone and god bless thank you very much